Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present part 11 of my series on the selected gross pathology of non-human primates. Lecture number 11 will cover the nervous system, as an, and as I do when I start any of these lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have, over the years, provided me their images either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. One of the first things that you should notice in this dorsal view of the brain in a non-human primate is the cerebellum is tucked underneath the caudal aspect of the cerebrum. This is normal positioning for bipeds. We're used to looking at dog and cat and cow and horse brains where the cerebellum comes much further out because the long axis of their spine is generally parallel to the ground. Well, it's different in non-human primates. So this is very normal. This is what you would expect to see in a non-human primate. So don't get tricked by that. Now, in this particular macaque brain, there is marked engorgement of the meningeal vessels and a tremendous amount of fibrin, which obscures the underlying gray matter. This is very characteristic of streptococcal meningitis in non-human primates. Whenever you see a, a lot of fibrin in any potential space, here are the meninges, but in other potential spaces like the pericardial sac, the pleural cavity, the abdomen, or the joints, I want you to think for just a moment, could this be strep? Because pathogenic strep, the beta hemolytic strep, like streptococcus pneumoniae, often result in a severe vasculitis, an escape of fibrin which will polymerize within the potential spaces. Uh, streptococcus pneumoniae is a bacteria that is often carried in the upper respiratory system of the primate handlers, the humans, and will be shed in times of stress, often when uh, winter time comes. And so this is the source for these particular animals and it causes a tremendous fibrinopurulent leptomeningitis. It can often also cause severe pneumonia, just like it does in people. If you told me that this brain was also uh, a streptococcal meningitis. I probably couldn't fight you on this one. Um, this one, however, happens to be uh, Staphylococcus. This is Staph Steptosemia. And when we see Staph, it often is the result of some form of immunosuppression. This animal also was uh, had simian retrovirus or uh, two infection or SAIDS. But uh, the animals are often immunosuppressed and have some type of indwelling catheter, uh, skull cap, uh, maybe some telemetry units, which are, you know, serve as a portal for pathogenic staphylococci to enter the body from, uh, from the outside where they are ubiquitous in the environment. We have flipped over the uh, the brain here. We're looking at the underside of the brain in the area of the hypothalamus and there is a large abscess here. Um, this is the brain of an African green monkey. African green monkeys are well known for developing a, a Klebsiella septicemia. Klebsiella pneumoniae is the agent of the so-called shipping fever of uh, various non-human primate species, including African greens, uh, essentially any type of uh, a macaque, chimpanzees, um, and it's usually associated with previous transport or some stressful event, perhaps a, a surgical intervention of some type. And Klebsiella often manifests in the lungs, but you can see abscesses throughout the rest of the body. When I talk about abscesses, it's somewhat of a misnomer because Klebsiella is a coliform which has the ability to form a thick mucoid capsule and uh, there's often not a lot of inflammation associated with it because that mucoid capsule sort of keeps it hidden from the uh, body's immunosurveillance mechanisms. It's a, a, a very uh, successful 
uh, way for these type of uh, infections to take root throughout the body and uh, cerebral abscesses or meningeal abscesses are not uncommon in uh, Klebsiella septicemia. Here's an older picture of a young macaque from uh, Tulane University and it has a very characteristic pose of an animal that has been exposed to Clostridium tetani. Uh, the the uh, toxic agent is tetanospasm and that's a toxin that prevents the firing of Renshaw cells and Renshaw cells are very important uh, in our spinal cord and, and uh, innervation of, of our muscles because they are inhibitory to the lower motor neurons. The lower, our lower motor neurons are actually almost continually firing. It's only the presence of Renshaw cells which causes, um, which keeps our muscles from continually contracting. And uh, when the tetanospasm binds to the receptors on the uh, Renshaw cells, uh, they no longer inhibit the constant firing of lower motor neurons. So, so all the muscles of the body will ultimately contract. Um, in other domestic species, usually all four legs are out um, rigid, but because in bipeds, in people and in non-human primates, the biceps muscle is stronger than the triceps muscle, the arms will actually be drawn into, into sort of a, a pugilistic posture, but all of the other uh, uh, muscles of this poor animal's uh, body are are firing. The legs are out. The tail is up. The ears are back. the The eyes are in a uh, a very surprised look. Even the facial muscles are affected in this particular case, and the animal will fairly shortly. Uh, probably die of a combination of exhaustion and respiratory arrest. Back to looking at the top of the brain again. Really nice picture um, of the cerebellum and its normal location here. And what we are seeing in the meninges is a single cystocircus um, of the human tapeworm tinea solium. Um, this is the circus. Uh, unfortunately, has its own name too, as the cestode uh, parasitologists have given uh, names both to the immature and the mature forms of the same parasite, um, and it is known as cystocircus cellulose. Okay, um, this will also, this particular parasite will, uh, the adult will live in the GI tract of humans and the larva um, primarily affect pigs um, where it's seen within the uh, cardiac and some of the skeletal muscles particularly the muscles of mastication the tongue and sometimes the shoulder muscles um, and then occasionally uh, aberrant migration of this larval form both in the pig as well as in primate species, including humans, and occasionally dogs, um, it will turn up in the meninges, where if it grows to a significant extent, it can cause uh, neurologic disease. Here is a great picture and you have to look closely, but when you look closely, you will see that there is a large focus, maybe two foci within the white, primarily within the white matter of the uh, uh, cerebrum of this macaque, which is an immunosuppressed macaque, and the white matter is, is basically just liquefied. This is a condition that is called progressive multifocal leukoencephalomyelopathy. And it's thought to be a reactivation of the polyomavirus SV40 in animals that are severely immunosuppressed. Most non-human primates 
and including humans, are infected with a number of polyomaviruses, which generally don't cause any problems and are latent unless a severe loss of cell-mediated immunity, such as occurs with simian lentivirus infection or human lentivirus infection, occurs. There's actually two manifestations of polyomavirus disease uh, in non-human primates. Uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which we are looking at here, is seen in uh, immunosuppressed animals as a result of activation of latent infection. The virus infects oligodendrocytes, and, and the lesion is progressive demyelination with infiltration of gitter cells and, and if severe, liquefactive necrosis, as seen here. These animals may also have a, uh, a mild tubular interstitial nephrosis, as the uh, kidney is also a place where you will see the polyomavirus inclusions. Uh, in young animals who are infected for the first time with polyomavirus, you have a syndrome which is usually not as severe, which is just called meningoencephalitis. So this is polyomavirus infection in immunosuppressed macaques, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML. Here's an absolutely gorgeous picture, um, which shows areas of thrombosis, necrosis, and hemorrhage. And look how it outlines the gray-white interface. This is a condition that is seen, um, was primarily diagnosed uh, initially in humans and has been seen in, uh, uh, in non-human primates. And, and like a number of diseases, it's something that is readily recognized, but the actual pathogenesis is not well established. The condition is known as central venous thrombosis usually occurring mostly within the white matter, but, but grossly at the gray-white matter interface. And the cause is unknown. It's possibly due to dehydration. I don't like to show a lot of, uh, uh, of histo images in my gross lectures, but this is one that really shows nicely the thrombosis that is seen in these uh, uh, large veins at the gray-white matter interface. So central venous thrombosis, an absolutely fantastic gross lesion that should be somewhat recognizable. The other possibility here, and it's somewhat remote in a non-human primate, but in a human, um, I would consider the possibility of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a rickettsial disease which is only seen in primates and dogs. It's never been documented in other species and also has a characteristic pattern of necrosis, vasculitis, and resultant hemorrhage at the gray-white matter interface. So just something to briefly think about. And let's wind up this uh, particular lecture um, with a, a brain from a uh, newborn macaque. Um, it's not really newborn. Probably this animal had, had lived for a couple of weeks. And uh, you can see that the depressions on either side of the brain um, and a mild amount of cerebral edema is present here. And uh, this type of hypoxia is seen in primates, including, unfortunately, humans uh, with birth hypoxia, birth hypoxia resulting in necrosis of uh, uh, significant amounts of of gray and white matter, which over time will um, will be liquefied, removed. The there will be expansion of the uh, ventricles, so-called hydrocephalus ex vacuo, and it's a very unfortunate uh, birth incidence as a result of hypoxia during parturition. Okay, well that completes. Uh, this particular lecture. Uh, in our next lecture, we will cover, and we're getting down to the end of the non-human primates. I think we have two left. Our next lecture will cover the reproductive system, and we will, we will finish with lucky number 13, which will be musculoskeletal 
diseases of non-human primates. Thank you so much for, uh, for your attention, and I hope you have a great day.